morning. morning. This morning's scripture reading is from Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 19, verses 1 through 3. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem, and Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him, and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, and that you have removed the wooden images from the land and, and have prepared your heart to seek God. When Rehoboam asc ascended the throne after his father Solomon died, the United Kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon was divided between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. All the kings of the northern kingdom, which is called the kingdom of Israel, who followed Jeroboam were evil because they continued in the idolatry that was introduced by Jeroboam. You remember last week we looked and studied how Jeroboam corrupted the religion of Jehovah God. Nevertheless, some of the kings, that is, of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, were good and righteous. And one such king was Jehoshaphat. We're going to be looking at three different kings today. And we're going to be looking at what they did in their early life and how it affected the rest of their lives. This lesson is really directed towards our young people this morning. And I'm sorry to say that before the last song, most of our young people left the auditorium for some reason. I don't quite understand that. But we're here together in worship. I want us to look at the background of our reading this morning because we need to be looking at setting our hearts upon God at a very early age. Today will be the last day for a number of our young people for they will be going away to school. Maggie is going to be going to Harding this week. Rachel uh, McKenzie will be returning back to the University of Illinois today. Ashley Budziak, uh, who's here uh, on occasion, will be entering into the uh, University at Valparaiso. And so they're going to be leaving their families. And the one thing we want to say to them is please set your heart upon God and not upon your friends or the world about you. Even though we see some negative things concerning Je uh, Jehoshaphat in our reading. I'd like to point out that in another passage of scripture, Jehoshaphat is highly praised by God. I'd like for us to look at 1 Kings chapter 22, beginning with verse 41. For it reads, Jehoshaphat the son of Asa had become king over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king. And he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name is Zuba, the daughter of Shehai. And he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from them, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. For the people offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Also, Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. We see here Jehoshaphat 
made a very foolish alliance with the king of the northern kingdom, Ahab. And that alliance was sealed by a marriage between Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, and Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab. On one occasion, Ahab proposes that the two kingdoms join forces against Syria in order to regain the city of Ramoth Gilead. You remember that this was one of the cities of refuge that had been assigned by Moses. In other words, when a crime had been done or a person had been murdered, either accidentally or purposely, the perpetrator could run to a city of refuge to receive justice, lest the avenger of blood would come and kill him. And so Ramoth Gilead was one such city. And when consulted, God's prophet Micaiah strictly warned both kings against their joint venture against Syria. If you've been here any time at all, you'll know that that is one of my favorite stories of the Old Testament. Because when Ahab made this proposal to Jehoshaphat, the first thing that righteous Jehoshaphat wanted to do was consult with the Lord. And Ahab said, okay, let's consult. Let's get some prophets out here. And what does he do? He parades all of his yes-men prophets out who tell Ahab exactly what he wants to hear. And Jehoshaphat is very suspicious. He says, is there not yet a prophet of Jehovah that we might inquire of him? And you remember Ahab's response to that? Well, yes, we do have such a prophet. His name is Micaiah. But I don't like him. He never has anything good to say about me. And so Jehoshaphat says, let not the king say so. Let's hear from him. And you remember at first, Micaiah tells Ahab exactly what he wanted to hear, and Ahab knew it wasn't the truth. And so he calls upon Micaiah to go ahead and give his prophecy. And his prophecy was that they are not going to prevail against Syria. And so what happens? Foolishly, Jehoshaphat ignores the prophecy, and he goes into battle anyway. I've always thought that was rather interesting. You weren't willing to go until you heard what Jehovah God had to say, and then when you hear him say, don't go, you go anyway. You said, yeah, that's really funny. That's really strange. How often have we done the same thing? We know what God says not to do, and we do it anyway. And so we can certainly identify with Jehoshaphat. Doesn't excuse him, but we understand what he did. And so as Micaiah had predicted, the military campaign does not go well for these two kings. In fact, it gets so bad that Ahab decides that he's going to have to look out for his own neck. He's going to have to look out for number one. And so he really calls upon Jehoshaphat to cover for him. I want you to read with me how the Bible records this for me. Look at 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 29. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. Nice guy, huh? You go in there as the king. I don't want them to identify me as king. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. 
You know, I think there was a reason for his wanting to protect himself in this situation. Because the king of Syria didn't like Ahab any more than did God. They were both out to get Ahab. Because this man was a wicked man. And so thinking Jehoshaphat is Ahab, the Syrians go after him. And the Bible says that Jehoshaphat cries out. Let's read it. Verse 31 of chapter 22. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariot, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So it was. When the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. Therefore they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. Everybody was coming after him because they thought he was Ahab. It's a good thing that Jehoshaphat was a righteous king. And he was in the favor of God because God heard that cry. And so God spares Jehoshaphat's life. And as hard as Ahab tried, he could not escape the judgment of God, even when he disguised himself. All oh, the wonderful providence of God, when you see it played out, in this contest. It's a little lengthy, but let's read the rest of the story found in 1 Kings chapter 22, beginning with verse 33. And it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, that is Ahab, that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. Do you get the picture here? Some guy, not aiming at anything, just shoots an arrow in the air. And it finds its mark at Ahab, but at the right place where he's vulnerable between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of the battle. For I am wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wound unto the floor of the chariot. Then, as the sun was going down, a shout went throughout the army, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria. And they buried the king in Samaria. Then someone washed his chariot in a pool at, at a pool in Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood while the harlots bathed, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken. Notice the dogs eat up his blood. The harlots bathed in the very water the blood ended up. Do you remember what happened to his wife, Jezebel? Her bones were eaten by the dogs. Nothing was left of either one of them. That, that's, really, that's really amazing when we think about it. I want us for just a few moments to look at these three kings. Two of the kings are evil. But there is one king who is good. You see, both Ahab and Rehoboam fight, fell out of favor with God. Fell out of his favor. Rehoboam foolishly took the self-serving advice of his childhood friends. And the king, as we're about to find out, is 41 years old 
and he's listening to his childhood buddies. Remember when Solomon died, the people came to Rehoboam and said, please lift the burden that your father put on us. He taxed us heavily so he could, so he could live this extravagant life. Give us some relief. And the king says, give me a few days and I'll come back with my answer. And when he talked, the elders said, listen to the people, relieve them and they will serve you faithfully. And he went to his childhood friends who were probably spoiled rotten because they grew up around the palace, had no self-discipline of their own. And they said, you go back and tell them if, you're, if you think my father made it bad, I'll make it even worse for you. Because I want it all. And here's what we read. It says, but he rejected. This is chapter 12 beginning with verse 8. But he rejected the advice of the elders had given him. And consulted the young men who had grown up with him. Who stood before him. And he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him saying, thus you shall speak to this people who have spoken to you saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now where has my father put a heavy yoke on you? I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips. I will chasten you with scorpions. And what happened? Ten of the tribes rebelled. That is how the northern kingdom came to be. And King Ahab is now their king. And all these kings are wicked. They continue in the idolatry introduced by Jeroboam. And so Rehoboam chose foolishly because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Look at the the account we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 12 verses 13 and 14. Thus Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. Now Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitess. And he did evil. Why? Because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. I don't know about you, but I find this statement truly amazing. Because when you read the book of Proverbs, most of which was written by Solomon, Rehoboam's father, it was written for the benefit of his son, who undoubtedly was Rehoboam. And so Solomon is trying to teach his son wisdom. But Rehoboam refused to set his heart on the Lord. And thus he was a fool. Probably the biggest fool outside of Abigail's husband that we ever read in the New, in the Bible. He had all the advantages. He had good teaching. But he never set his heart upon the Lord. It destroyed him And it destroyed his nation. It caused the people to rebel. 
How sad. You see, Rehoboam forsook God. You know what God did? He forsook Rehoboam. Look at 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 5. Here's another prophet. It says, Then Shemaiah, the prophet, came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak and said to them, Thus says the Lord, you have forsaken me, therefore I have also, I have left you. In other words, I have forsaken you in the hand of Shishak. Who is Shishak? king of Egypt that came up against Jerusalem took all the treasures out of the temple really left Rehoboam with nothing we read for instance in 1 Kings chapter 10 at the very height of his reign when Rehoboam assumed to be king. Solomon had made shields of gold, 300 of them. 300 shields of gold for display, each one having three pounds of gold in it. But after Shishak came, all those shields were confiscated. And Rehoboam substituted shields of brass. Can you imagine on those days of splendor when the king presented himself, everybody knowing that they were only shields of brass that used to be shields of gold? That had to have been awfully disappointing. Furthermore, I want you to consider this. It, within five years after being made king, Rehoboam lost nearly all the gains that his father Solomon had made. Now, at the beginning, it seems that he tried to do pretty well, but God had set his face against Rehoboam. Why? because he would not set his heart upon the Lord. And that fifth year was devastating. That's when Shishak came. Okay, here's a lengthy reading. But I want you to get the feeling of what's going on here. We're reading from chapter 14, verse 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamah and Amoritus. We read that before. Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. Notice, this is really ascribed to Judah. How did that happen? Because Rehoboam had the opportunity, had the responsibility to lead the people right. But you can't lead people right when you're not right. And Rehoboam wasn't right. And once again, verse 22, Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than all their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also perverted persons in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. 300 of them. 
Then King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards carried them, then brought them back into the garrison, guard room. Everybody knows that they're only shields of brass. How sad. Yes, God was very angry with Jehoshaphat that he had not listened to his prophet. Let's go back to our scripture reading again this morning. Verse 1. It reads, Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. And said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. How is he helping the wicked? He's made an alliance with wicked King Ahab. He should have had nothing to do with Ahab. After he had done that and escaped with his life, you suppose that Jehoshaphat pondered his mistake for years to come? Hmm? He was warned, but he didn't do it. Both he and Rehoboam were foolish. But Rehoboam was an evil king. Jehoshaphat was righteous. I want you to note that because of what he did, that God stood by Jehoshaphat. Now read once again verse 3. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. That was the determining factor right there. He had set his heart upon the Lord. I think that all of us in one way or the other can identify with Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was not a perfect man. Jehoshaphat made mistakes. We are human. We do make mistakes. but he had set his heart upon the Lord. Good things are found in you. You have prepared your heart to seek God. I want you, I'm going to put up on the screen, but I want you to turn into your Bibles with me. Psalm 37 and verse 23. Some time ago, Brother Eugene Short pointed out a passage that I uh, had listed several years ago that I thought was very significant. But here's a passage that I read and reflected upon right when I began preaching. I'm talking about Psalm 37, and I want you to read it with me because if you don't get anything else out of our lesson today, I want you to remember this because it really applies to Jehoshaphat. Now here's what it says. It says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Now listen to him. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. That's what he did with Jehoshaphat. Oh, we have brethren, we have preachers that are very anxious, anxious to assign you to hell. And they do not realize that God is long-suffering. He's very gracious. 
He will stand with us even though we are not perfect. He will help us as long as what? As we set our hearts upon the Lord. That's what really mattered. That was the difference between Rehoboam and Ahab and Jehoshaphat. All three were men. All three were very human. But only one of the three determined to set his heart upon the Lord. And, they, and he did it early in life. Because it led him all through life. Now listen to me carefully for what our text is telling us. When Jehoshaphat set his heart on God, he was set for life. That's what we want for ourselves. That is what we want for our youth. That is what we desire. And that's what we should be seeking. We need to be honest with ourselves. Have we ever made that determination to set our hearts upon the Lord? What, what happens to our young people? They're being influenced everywhere. particularly by their peers. And they want to please their peers. They, do not, they want to be accepted. Everybody wants to be accepted. That's what happened to Rehoboam. He went with their advice. And the Bible calls him a fool. He's a fool. Because he did not set his heart upon the Lord. And as a result, each decision that he made from that point on just put him deeper and deeper in a hole. And he still would not repent. It destroyed him and it destroyed his nation. We are blessed to have such a wonderful God who is so long-suffering with us, so patient with us, wanting us to see and do what is right. Rehoboam didn't listen to his father. Do we listen to ours? We already know what the outcome will be if we don't. But we also know that if we will set our hearts upon the Lord, he will stand with us. He will not forsake us. What is your decision this morning? You can't do it without becoming a child of God through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. Or if you are a child of God, maybe you have never been challenged before to make that determination in your heart. Do it now. Do it today. While together we stand and sing.